Hello, this is Rod. This is Savannah Army Depot Overview post-World War II. So this place had a school that tens of thousands of students graduated from. It was an ammunition school. And when I'm talking about ammunition, I'm not talking just about small arms. I'm talking about any ordnance, including missiles, they were trained in. So there was a person, an ammo specter from Savannah. He graduated from Savannah High School. Uh, he did get killed in Afghanistan in October of 2016 by a person dressed in an Afghan soldier uniform. So the school actually got moved to McAllister, Oklahoma. And I should clarify that these ammo inspectors, they're civilians. Uh, they're considered civilian army. So most of the inspections, if not all of them, are actually done by these ammo inspectors. So on a side note, I should tell you that the person in charge of the school in the late 80s, early 90s, he was making six-digit figures. Now, this is 32 years ago. He was making a little over 100000 a year, and he never took a vacation, so... He had built up two years of pay that he would have received when he retired. Unfortunately, he did get killed in a tractor accident. So the lesson I want to convey about this incident is that at least use some of your vacation because you might not live to get the, the payout at the end. And it's really not healthy for you to not take a vacation. So I asked an ammo inspector that was retired and how soon you could retire and he, I was told that you had to be at least 55 and had 30 years on the job. So I had a relative here that was a admin assistant to an engineering group and this engineering group shared the, the same break room with this ammunition school. Uh, this place actually had engineers, they had a data center, and they had programmers working here. I don't exactly know what they were doing, uh, some kind of weapons research, I never asked. They wouldn't have told me anyway, but I had this informal interview set up with this upper level manager, decision maker, and this is with no effort on my part, not filling out an application or anything, but it just happened that right before the, this interview was to take place I found out this person I went to school with in Savannah and actually had a introduction to data processing class with in college he had just came back from Korea and he got in the program when he was 21 so I actually met up with with him and he told me the specifics about the program so I decided not to go forward with the informal interview with this upper level manager decision maker at, at this Quasa school quality assurance specialist ammunition surveillance because at that time the ammunition school the regular regular ammo inspector was one year and this Quasis was a two-year program and you do get paid when you're in training but you do have to sign a contract with the government stating that you do it for five years. And if you don't follow through with a contract, you had to pay the government back $70,000. And this is 32 years ago. So I decided not to move forward to it with the uh, informal interview. Didn't want to waste this upper level manager's time. And that's what happened there. So. So after World War II, this one location was better armed than the majority of countries at the time. And eventually in the 60s and 70s, there's kind of a conflicting dates in my research. It was better armed than any, any country in, in the world. And that is where the special weapons comes in. Just from the brochures that I've, I've seen, they had a couple of museums on the premises, the John M. Browning Museum, which he was the 
uh, gunsmithing inventor of quite a few firearms used in World War II. So after the Korean War, uh, there was a ceasefire in June 1953. The newly inaugurated Eisenhower administration had come to a basic and drastic policy decision. Uh, under political pressure to reduce defense spending, they will rely on air-delivered nuclear power to deter potential enemies. So that will bring us to the mysterious J area that was built in this army depot. I came across this news article where this person that they, they, they interviewed, it, he states that there is an atomic weapon stored at this place, but I know it was a fact that there was. So he even says that if they were to, they wouldn't tell you to begin with. So Savannah Ordnance Depot was renamed Savannah Army Depot on August 1, 1962, and it received a special weapons mission on January 1, 1966, and an authorization to construct facilities to support this mission. Eight magazines were constructed along with a check and assembly building, a warehouse and a guardhouse. This area, fenced and designated J area, also including the former liquid propellant storage area constructed in 1957 and 23 earth covered magazines annexed from E area. A new special weapons work workshop was completed in 1970 and the special weapons mission was terminated in 1975. The DARTCOM, U.S. Army Material Development and Readiness Command Ammunition Center, was established at the depot in July 1971. It was, was redesignated the U.S. Army Defense Ammunition Center and School in 1979, and it provided technical, logistical, consultant, engineering, training, and other specialized ammunition services to the Department of Defense. The special operations that were conducted at the depot were done strictly by military units. However, there was some knowledge of the special weapons store there among the civilian employees. In an interview with Wayne Harmon, he called, they had missiles in there by the hundreds. Harmon also recalled that it was fairly common knowledge that missiles were being made and stored at the depot. However, when civilian employees did enter the special weapons zone, as Harmon did when he replaced batteries, they were all, all escorted in and out by military personnel. The process of storing the missiles was an extremely complex process. According to Harmon, the process involved a cradle manufactured by the machine shop at the depot. It took them months to get this cradle up because it was all made out of aluminum and the heat from the setting it out overnight would cause the cradle to expand and contract. The missiles were assembled in the cradle, were, were then stored in the special Eagle magazines. These Eagles had to be kept at room temperature year-round. So the room temperature thing, that's 68 degrees. That's a standard measure in metrology where they, a gauge room would be at 68 degrees for gauge blocks and for measuring uh, any type of measurements for... Uh, Engineer. So this is all the information I could find about the mysterious J area. I do know that it was heavily guarded, and this is all. This article here is the only thing I could find about the 516th uh, being there at at the time. Uh, I do know there there was at least 300 military guards, not including the civilians, and I was also told by. A government official that the special forces were assigned here also so that's pretty much all I could find about that I did have a relative that tried to get close to the place on a boat and they actually had guards that stopped them on the Mississippi River so I've also read and I don't know how true it is they actually used to x-ray trucks going leaving and coming so I came across an article 
where they used to test security at this location and in this specific instance they were able to simply gain access by walking across the dam on the Mississippi River and also by in, in impersonating an officer. So I came to the conclusion after research is that the Russians most likely did not know what actually was going on here. I had this book that was published by Paladin Press sometime in the 1980s, and it was a, I think it was named the Complete Book of the AR-15 or uh, some kind of a book on the AR-15. And I'm looking at at some of the pictures, and it would it would state. Uh, testing in Savannah at Savannah Proving Grounds and I'm thinking to myself I didn't know this place was still a proving ground after World War II. The original M16 was a failure in the field it was actually designed for stick powder and somehow it got switched to ball powder which which burns much dirtier and has higher gas pressure uh, so, so the solution was to chrome line the barrel. They had to make some modifications to the bolt carrier and the bolt lockup, and they added a forward assist, which you can manually press the the, the bolt in, uh, the bolt into battery. So, the model that they came out with was called M16A1, which is model 16 alteration one. The major supplier of the M16A1 in Vietnam was, believe it or not, General Motors, and specifically the Hydromatic Division of General Motors. They made hundreds of thousands of them. So both the M16, M16A1, and the M4 are direct impingement firearms. So the gas is directed straight back to the bulk carrier. And that, and that is how the uh, action gets cycled. I see in the new rifle that, uh, that the Army specifically is purchasing, they've gone back to piston driven. So the piston will cycle the bolt. So Michael was right. He always said if the depot ever closed in Savannah that Savannah would become a ghost town. And he was correct about that. Really, the question that should be asked is, why was it closed? It's it's a super fun site. They used heavy, heavy, heavy usage of asbestos in the buildings. And the, the ground's contaminated with TNT, some parts, mustard gas, and depleted uranium. I see in 2022, Savannah got named USA's Today's Best Small Town for Adventure. So, beginning in 2009, I used to drive down the Riverbend Road to get to the Black Oak Dune Overlook. And I used to actually drive past that because there was the road still there for the ammo silos. You'll see in a, a few seconds what I'm talking about. So, this gate wasn't there. So, in 2017, I was driving right here. And there was a person in a black Nissan with Iowa plates wearing some kind of black terry cloth jumpsuit. And he asked me if I was with the Fish and Wildlife. And I told him no. And then he said, well, there's no reason for you to be driving down the road then. So the map just was there, shows you what I'm talking about. So I called the Fish and Wildlife employee and I asked them what was going on and the reason I called them was I thought they were actually poaching because I'd drive down this road and there'd be deer running next to my RAV4 that I had rented at the time and he finally admitted that it was private security that they were he said it was nine miles down the road that they were cleaning up the hand grenade pit and it was taking two years to clean up the hand grenade pit. So one thing that I could never understand is that a private military contractor Blackwater they built a 
elaborate shooting range and training center 24 miles from here. And they were actually using the abandoned Shimer College for some of the training. And I always thought, what a strange area to build uh, a training center. They called it Blackwater North. It still exists, but I believe it's been sold three or four times. So the private military contractor Blackwater, that's the the group they make fun of in the A-Team movie that was released in 2010. That's the same group that got in trouble in Baghdad. I think they're on their third or fourth name now.